company applied for planning permission to erect a block of prestige offices in the centre of York. Now, being York, before permission could be given, the application had to be gone through with a fine tooth comb by the archaeologists and the historians. Now, what those archaeologists and historians discovered not only put a stop to the planning application, but also set in motion a restoration project which has now restored to York one of the most remarkable jewels of its medieval inheritance. The city of York, a treasure house of living history. Tens of thousands of people come here every year to soak up the atmosphere of a great medieval city. From the glories of the Minster to the streets where little has changed in 500 years. But behind these streets lie unexpected treasures, often hidden from public gaze, in some cases their very existence completely unguessed at. In what was once a plumber's workshop in the shadow of the Minster, just such a place has emerged from obscurity. This is how it's looked for most of the 20th century, a nondescript corner of a back street. But 500 years ago, this was one of the poshest addresses in town, the palatial home of Alderman William Snowshill, a grandee who counted kings and queens among his acquaintances and who regularly entertained the great and the good in his Yorkshire home. In William Snowshill's apartment, his guests discussed affairs of state. Such a, such a young man should, oh, yeah. should die so early. True. And so sudden. And so, yes, mistress, but, but these, these things do happen. I, I hear it, it was a fishing accident. It was a sickness from a fishing accident, ah, I think. Ah, yes, the, there's many rumours, you see, many yeah, rumours. someone told me it was from the lair. While other members of the household found agreeable ways of passing the time. <coughs> Elsewhere in the house, the staff went about their daily business. If you want going out of this household like you are with whoever else, then just carry on the way you're going. Polishing everything from furniture to armour. Preparing the breakfast. And cleaning the great hall. Students of history take the parts of members of the medieval household in an exquisite building which for many years was buried from sight beneath a covering of crumbling Victorian masonry. It was only when developers applied for permission to turn it into an office block, the treasure came to light. This was being restored as a prestige offices and we were invited to do a little archaeological excavation as part of the, the job. And it suddenly occurred to us that uh, these shouldn't be prestige offices. They were interesting buildings that could be turned into something really very exciting and extremely useful in the business of telling the public about the past. Um, our architects, Russell and Paula Wright, were able to identify the timbers, sometimes out of position, reused as floor joists, and find out what the original building was like. So we had this clear picture in our mind what it had been like, and we decided to take it back to the condition it was in in the 1480s, at the end of the Middle Ages. The huge task of taking the building apart and then putting it back together again in its authentic form has been preserved for posterity on videotape by the York Archaeological Trust cameraman, Simon Hill. I began filming the work at Barley Hall in August 1987. The slow task of dismantling the frame of the building, timber by timber, was already well underway with the position of every piece of wood being carefully recorded. The building was like a giant jigsaw puzzle, taking a team of over a dozen specialists to figure out exactly how these timbers interlocked and how they'd kept the building together for over 500 years. 
Every one of the thousand or more timbers and pegs, however small or apparently insignificant, was examined and its position in the building recorded. Timbers that were still sound were stored for eventual reuse in the reconstruction. As the timber frame was dismantled, metal scaffolding was used to support the surrounding buildings. The ground was now laid for more conventional archaeology to take place. The very slow but necessary task of gradually scraping away the well-trodden layers of Barley Hall's history revealed the very smallest pieces of evidence. Evidence that would nonetheless ensure the accurate recreation of life in 15th century York. With the archaeological excavation still underway in York, the skeleton of the new Barley Hall was beginning to take shape in the yard of McCurdy's in Reading. This company of timber building craftsmen would, over a period of many months, totally rebuild Barley Hall. They would use only the finest quality oak and, wherever possible, splice original timbers with the new wood. At McCurdy's, traditional techniques sit happily alongside modern power tools. Both require great care and skill. The oak is very unforgiving, and a small mistake could render an entire timber useless. As the timbers are completed and the frame begins to come together, every joint must be checked and double-checked. Every peg hole must be lined up against the others. When fully assembled and checked, the frame will be totally dismantled and taken by road to York. Back in York, the McCurdy crew have arrived ahead of the timbers and have time for a briefing on the complicated task that lay ahead. The timbers are unloaded in St Helens Square, taken by trolley up Stonegate, and then carefully manoeuvred along Coffee Yard, the narrow passage that leads to Barley Hall. Here, the timbers are assembled for the final time. If just one joint didn't fit, the whole project would be delayed. These are anxious times for all. The original timbers, salvaged from the 15th century structure, and the new timbers, are at last hoisted into position. There is no reason to doubt that these two will be there in another 500 years' time. As they finally slot into position, Barley Hall once more takes shape. Blacksmiths, stonemasons, woodcarvers, weavers and potters all have a part to play in the reconstruction of Barley Hall. The hundreds of tiles that cover the roof have all been made by hand, many by John Hudson, the West Yorkshire potter who's made many of the plates, bowls and jugs that will soon be used by the household of Barley Hall. The evidence of John's work that is most easy to see is the ridge tiles that nestle unobtrusively amidst the medieval skyline of the city's rooftops. It takes about 20 minutes to make each ridge tile, the puddling of the clay, the shaping of the tile and the forming of the decoration. Each tile is subtly different from the others, but all earn the potter's mark before being put out to dry.
The final seal of approval, however, is given not by John, nor the architect, but by Bess, John's Come faithful on. companion. After firing in the kilns, the tiles are stacked for eventual delivery to Barley Hall. Now that the structure of the hall is complete, the historians are working on the fine details. We've used the structure of the building, the timbers that were there, uh, to tell us what the upper part was like. We've used the information from archaeology, from what we excavated below the ground, to add details such as the roof details and the floor details and other things like that. And the third source is documentary evidence, because we're right in the heart of the medieval town here. These buildings are very well documented. Uh, the particular ones we <coughs> have here have uh, um, leases and so on still preserved at Nostal Priory, which used to own this place in the Middle Ages. And there are wills uh, that are preserved in the cathedral in the Minster Library and elsewhere, relating to people who lived around here. So we get a very clear idea from what they had in their wills, the objects in their houses and who they left them to, or inventories that were made, of what life was like here in the late Middle Ages. And it's one of the few places in the country you can put all these things together, the archaeology, the standing structure, the evidence of the documentary evidence, and still make it live in the heart of what is essentially a, a largely medieval layout in the middle of York. The York Archaeological Trust has won worldwide praise for its Jorvik Viking Centre, in which life-size replicas are used to conjure up a vivid picture of life in 11th century York. With this new venture, they're planning to go one step further. The important thing about the eventual role of this house is that it will actually be a living and working household, not with dummies or even the best audio-visual, good though they are, can't match up for people. So what we're going to do is to very carefully train a number of people to actually become William Snowsill and his household. And they will actually operate this house day after day after day. They won't pretend to do things. They will cook the meals and eat them and wash up. They won't pretend to do it, they'll actually do it. And that is going to be something very special. They will stick in their roles, and I hope eventually, as far as it's possible, they will become the people they're portraying, so that you can walk back into the 1480s and you can walk into someone's house and see it working. Not pretending to work, but actually working. The truly exquisite restoration at Barley Hall, and that really is going to be worth seeing. Well, that's all from Edit 5 for this week. Back next Thursday at the same time. Until then, good night. <laughs>